What does it mean to be loved by God? A question that probably many of you, like me, take for granted most of the time, but when you think about it, it can overwhelm you, that God loves you. What does it mean to be loved by God? Well, it means that many of the most important truths of the created universe have been revealed to you. It means that you can face today as it truly is, a day that contains some sorrow, as you remember our dear loved ones, our fellow saints of the faith who have died and gone ahead of us, but also a day of complete and eternal joy, a joy that wraps up those sorrows. That's why today's like today, those who are not of the faith think we're fools. Today doesn't make sense to those who don't know Jesus, to those who tragically don't know that God loves them. They look at us and wonder, how can you smile in the midst of such pain? How can you have joy in the midst of such grief? And we know that that is only possible because God loves us, that God loved them and gave him gave them the very same gifts of love that He gives to you today and every time you come to Him. It means that we know. We know God because in His love He has revealed Himself to us in power and grace in His Son, the Word made flesh. Today is All Saints Day. Today, we celebrate and commemorate the saints of the church, which include those saints in our own lives, who we remember fondly, who taught us many important things, not to mention probably taught us many things about our faith in God. But the truth that sits at the heart of today is a truth that the unbelieving world doesn't know that God loves us. Now, we know this because of the gift of faith that has been given to us, because it has been revealed to us, given to us by God Himself, and because we know our readings today, which to be clear in any other context would be nonsense, describe exactly how we feel today. In all the world, it is only those loved by God that truly know. Now, you might be asking at this point, what do we know that others don't? Now, I don't have time to go into the Beatitudes today because I'm not preaching on Matthew 5, but I want to challenge you sometime this week to read those and read them imagining that you don't know anything about Jesus and see if they make any sense. So, argue without Jesus they don't make any sense. They seem foolish. But for those of us who know the truth of Jesus, they describe the strange in-between of being in the world and not of the world, having been given a life not meant for this world but the one unending to come, then it makes sense. We know that God loves us. And dear friends in Christ, I encourage you, do not take that knowledge for granted. For those of us who have been blessed to be in the faith since our young days, we take that for granted. It becomes just a part of our life, but know that many people don't know that. And some even think that God doesn't like them, that He opposes them, that He seeks their harm and their hurt but not us. We know because He has revealed to us by the Almighty Word that from the beginning has created the very thing it declares. 
and that word has declared to you, you are my beloved child. And so you are. Our epistle reading today from 1 John chapter 3 echoes this truth. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. That last little sentence should hit you like a powerful hug from your heavenly Father. And so you are. State it quite simply because it needs no other reason than the declaration of God to you, and it becomes the reality of your life. You know you are a child of God, and here is your answer. How? Simply because He says so, and so you are. Now, we know that this is the humbling, unbelievable, and glorious truth that is at the heart of the sacraments of the church. In holy baptism, that same word from the beginning, God's word, declares you born anew. It declares you forgiven of your sins. It declares you a child of God, and so you are. If you've ever wondered why the Christ candle is lit during funerals for baptized believers, it's to remind the grieving of the promises that were given to the one who is no longer with us. A new and imperishable life with God. In Holy Communion, God's Word declares you washed clean of your sins in the blood of the Lamb like those in Revelation, pure because He is pure. It declares you righteous, not a righteousness of your own, but one that robes you in pure white, the righteousness of your Lord Jesus. So it was the gifts given to your loved ones who have gone before you in the faith and all of the saints since the church began. They are with Him where they are loved better than anywhere they could ever be loved and cherished more, even than we who love them and miss them dearly could ever do. We know that we are, by His gracious declaration and through His Spirit, children of God. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him because we shall see Him as He is." Now, it's all good that we have a knowledge and a truth that's been revealed to us, but what difference does that truth make? Well, the first point to be made is that it isn't simply knowledge that you have been given. It's not simply facts about a subject in school, but it's a knowledge about a new and present reality which even now has been made real in Jesus. Today, right now, as you sit in your pew, you are a child of God. That's not some uncertain future hope. It is something that God has given to you already. But today, especially as the specter of the great consequence of our sin looms large, it makes all the difference in the world, this truth that God loves you. That might be the only time I can think of where making all the difference in the world is not a hyperbolic statement, but in fact, the truth. For those of you who are mourning the loss of a saint of God in your life today, or who just feel the specter of death growing on the horizon, or even if it's somebody who has been gone for a while, this truth makes all the difference in the world, doesn't it? this love of God, the gifts of life everlasting, it makes all the difference. No, it doesn't take away the pain and sorrow of their loss, and it's okay to miss and to grieve. That's not a sign of a weak faith, but it does surround that pain and sorrow 
with a new reality of unsurpassed joy. It gives context to our sorrow that it no longer is one of eternity. It's no longer one of being finished never to be healed, but now it is a temporary sorrow, a temporary grief that is broken by an eternal joy in the promises of Jesus. And you don't have to just take my word for it, take His. And it's not just something about the future, but it's something that changes even now, before this wondrous and miraculous work of salvation has been finished and fulfilled. If we look back at 1 John, I want you to pay careful attention to the words he uses. He says, but we know that when He appears, that's not language of possibility or hope that something might happen. It's a certain hope in a thing that will happen, a thing that you have been given to know by the God of the universe who loves you, that He is coming. And it's not a question of if, but when. What does it mean to be loved by God? It means we know He is coming. We know He is coming in victory, victory over sin and sorrow, sadness, the devil, and even death. I thought about a lot of different images to capture the the power of this promise, this promise given to us by God. The same word that holds up the universe speaks this promise to us. So obviously, nothing fit perfectly because nothing can compare compare to such a promise from God Himself. Nothing can compare to the being that can speak words that make old things new and dead things alive. However, I want you to imagine that you're fighting in a battle. In the midst of this battle, a messenger is sent to you to tell you that the leader of the opposing forces is defeated. The enemy that has hounded you every breath and thought since you remember having them is no more. He's done, defeated, and put to rest. The battle might still linger for a short time, but the news of this truth brings immediate hope because it doesn't describe a future possibility, but a future certainty. It isn't just a hope for what will be when our champion returns to fulfill all the promises that he has made, but a certain and sure hope now. It is this promise that brings you comfort when death shows up in your life. It is this promise that today wraps your sorrow in a joy that is unbreakable, It is this promise that gives you hope in Him. And here's what 1 John says about hope in Him. And everyone who thus hopes in Him purifies himself as He is pure. So, dear friends in Christ, we know today that He is coming back. We know today that we can hope in Him. We know today that our loved ones who have died in the faith They are safer and more loved with Him than anywhere in all creation. And we know that we will see them again when He appears. We know what it means to be loved by God. In the name of Jesus, amen. May the peace of God, which passes our understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus until He does come back to fulfill all of His promises and bring us into His kingdom which has no end. Amen.